Good morning, church. Great to be here with you today. So glad to see all of you. If you would open your Bibles up to 1 Timothy, continuing in our series, Building a Biblical Church. You start by describing a scenario that might sound familiar. You know, so you're pulling up in an intersection to a tra- traffic light. The light's red. There's a car in front of you. And you pull in behind and you're stopped and you're waiting at the light and your gaze drifts over to your left and you notice that in the median there is a a man uh, sitting with a sign indicating need. And as you're kind of taking that in, you see the, the window roll down in the car ahead of you and then out goes an arm and there's a bill flapping out there and then the, the guy gets up and he takes the bill gladly and you think, well, should I do that? What, what should I do right now? Or let me try another scenario that maybe some of you have encountered or some of you will encounter. You're gathered around with family and you are talking about what to do for an aging parent. You know, maybe a situation where dad has died and it's been a little while and mom's been living by herself. But as time has gone by, the ability for mom to do what needs, she needs to do to take care of herself is becoming more and more difficult. She doesn't want to leave the house that you grew up in, right? Um, but she fell last week and luckily she had her phone where she could get to it and she, cause she couldn't get up. And you're around there with family thinking about what do we do? Those kinds of scenarios where the idea that we need to help people in need is very clear, but sometimes what to do is difficult because life is difficult. Sometimes what to do is not obvious because life is messy and challenging and confusing. Last week, Kevin Goodwin, I think, did a wonderful job introducing practical theology to us in this portion of the Bible that we're exploring over these weeks. By practical theology, we're talking about putting into practice what we know about God, what we believe about the Lord Jesus Christ, about the world, about ourselves because of him, our faith, putting that into practice, living integrated lives, right? Where what we think about and believe here shows up, you know, in the rest of life throughout the week. Practical theology connects what we believe to what we do, what we believe to what we do. And in the scripture passage that we're looking at today, we're going to find a model for uh, putting our theology into practice when it comes to, to, to facing the challenge of helping those who are in need around us. And what I hope to show you that in, in, when you boil it all down to its barest essential, that this passage is, is, is teaching Christians, teaching the church that True faith meets true need with true help. True faith meets true need with true help. Let's read the entire passage to get started, and then we'll, uh, we'll explore it piece by piece. So beginning in verse 3, chapter 5, the Apostle Paul writes, Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his own of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, has devoted herself to every good work. But refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander, for some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly 
widows. Please pray with me. Father, this is your word. Give us the grace to receive it today with reverence and humility and help me to preach faithfully from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the, the focal issue in this passage is it's fairly straightforward. Paul, the Apostle Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is speaking to Timothy with a first century uh, Ephesian church context in mind about the care of widows, caring for widows in, in their midst. As we're going to see um, the, the, the principles in this passage will apply, uh, apply more broadly, extending to various classes of persons left destitute and vulnerable. The basic idea, the focal idea here is the church must be a community that honors its widows and even more generally that protects and provides for those in similar need. But as I suggested by way of our introduction, the how is sometimes where it's challenging. And this, this passage indicates just that. That there are right ways and there are wrong ways to respond to those who are in need. And I I think if, uh, you know, if you're fairly young, uh, talk to somebody with some gray hair, you'll learn that life is often uh, messy and confusing. And, um, you know, if you're thinking in in, in your heart right now, well, just help people in need. How hard is that? Um, Yeah, you're, you're right about the heart of that, but the application of that sometimes can be can be challenging, and that's, that's, that's the difficulty that I think that the Apostle Paul, in his teaching to the Ephesian church, is grappling with. So let me say it this way. This passage is, it's not a passage that is saying to everyone, like a, 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 a platitude that we would put on a mug. It, it's, it's not saying to everyone, you need to do more to help people around you. It's quite unmistakably saying to some people, you need to do more to help people in need who are in your life. On the other hand, it is quite unmistakably saying, you need to do less or to do something different in the way that you're helping because sometimes your helping hurts. Now, before we launch off fully into the details, let me say one more thing by way of heads up or introduction so that we can hopefully see this in in a proper light. Some of the instructions in this passage are directed to very specific issues in the first century Ephesian church, and some of those don't translate to our circumstances. The social institutions are different. The way that families work, the way that government worked, the way that uh, how we think of charity worked, the way that uh, relationships worked, some of those are the same, and some of them are very different. But Romans 15.4 gives us a very important principle as later Christians looking back on these God-inspired texts. And here's the the principle. This is Romans 15.4. The Apostle Paul, after having just quoted a verse of Scripture, says to the people that he's writing to, he's quoted an Old Testament verse, which which would have been uh, very, very old, ancient, to the first century AD Christians that he's writing to. He says, whatever was written... In the scriptures, whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. Whatever was written in earlier times was not just written for their instruction, it was written for our instruction. So, when we as Christians, 21st century Christians, are are, are reading the Bible, we are looking for what are the timeless principles and indeed, in some cases, the direct commands that apply to us. And this passage is no different. Okay, so we're looking for how has God given timeless principles and commands to us for the benefit of his people in every age. And the first of those that I think we can see in this passage is to honor, honor true need. We could also say honor people, but specifically honor true need in this passage. Verse three, honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God alone. Verse 5 will go on to define a little further. We'll read that again. But she who is truly a widow. Now, a, a few weeks back, a dear sister in the 930 hour, you know, I love this, and I hope some of you do this, actually. It'll make you understand better whenever we get to this moment in our worship services. But she reads ahead. You know, she's reading the passage that she assumed would be the passage we were talking about that day. She was wrong. 
Um, but it wasn't her fault. It was my fault because I had turned one passage into two-part series. And so she was off a week. And then Kevin came and he preached because I had signed him that passage. So now we went back. We're all mixed up. But she was, um, she was reading this passage. And she read this and she said, true widow. What does that mean? What do you mean a true, a widow's a widow, you know? She was asking that question, a very good question. And you read this, it's a little bit puzzling. What do you mean a true, true widow? There are actually two questions that, that I think if we, we spend a little bit of time trying to answer them, we'll make this much clearer. So one question, what, is a, what, what, is, what does the Apostle Paul mean by truly a widow? And then the second is, what, what does he mean by honor, honor them? So let's, let's take honoring first. Um, to, to honor is to show value, to express value, or, or to, to, to have high regard for someone. Essentially, we honor people when we treat them like they are valuable. We honor people when we treat them like they're valuable. And th- this is a mark, as you read the Gospels, you look at the, the, the life of our Lord with, with, with people during his ministry. This is one of the notes that just rings out, the way that he honored people. We saw him value, show value to people that no one else saw much value in. Women and children, for example, saw an honor from Jesus that they didn't tend to see uh, in, the, in the surrounding culture. Poor people, diseased people, ostracized and marginalized people, forgotten people, sinful people Jesus honored. This is why it's recorded in the Gospels that the tax collectors and the sinners, the prostitutes, they flocked to him. And it wasn't because Jesus was preaching a message of prostitution is good. It wasn't that at all. He was saying quite the opposite. But they flocked to him. Why? Because he, he treated them like they were valuable. He showed honor to people. And there's a, a, a powerful example for us. Because when he talked to them about repentance they listened they felt his concern they felt his value they felt his care they felt honored and they listened when he talked about repentance and the life that God wanted for them to have and I I think there's just by way of application just to pause right here to, to apply this we have such an ability to do the work of Jesus in this world simply by showing value to people around us to honor them, to show them that they matter. It's the ministry of Jesus in the church, and it's, it's a profound opportunity we have every single day. Honor comes in all different shapes and sizes, and that's why it's important um, to recognize that in this passage, uh, honor is being used in, in a variety of ways. Honor can look like time. I love this story about Zacchaeus. Remember we Zacchaeus in the tree? You all know this story from, remember this one? Zacchaeus is a short guy. Couldn't see over the crowd, so he gets up in a tree because he wants to see Jesus coming down. Jesus comes, and Zacchaeus is in the tree, and he says, and I love this because he says, hey, I want to go over to your house. Can you have me over for dinner? <laughs> it's not normally how we communicate honor um, typically, but, but, but what, what Jesus was doing there was he was honoring Zacchaeus with his time. And we still communicate honor with time. We show people that they're valuable by giving our time to them. It can look like friendship, it can look like praise, it can look like respect, it can look like support, even financial. So we have this word in English, honorarium. Some of you maybe work in fields where you occasionally get an honorarium for what you do. That's, that's the idea that you're, you're, you're providing a fi- financial benefit as a, as a way of honoring, or remunerating uh, a service that's done. Um, and that's in view here. Now, the first question, what does it mean to honor? Second question, what, what, what are we doing here with the phrase truly widows? Why are we distinguishing some widows and then other widows? What's happening with that? Well, if you, and I invite you to do this, go get your online Bible or something and, and, and type in widow and look at all the references. There, there are uh, enough for you to get a real good sense, but not so many that you can't read in one sitting. But I think you will see that, that widow, the, the widow stands out throughout the, the Bible as representative of vulnerability on the one hand and also a virtue. You will find, you will find now we know that's a, that's a generalization, but as a class of people, 
in the scriptures, the widow kind of is put forth, orphans are at times as well, but put, put forth as an, as an example of a person who is worthy of support, who is, who is in need of, of help. And also, at times, is put forward as a, a person uh, characterized by virtue. Now, it seems to me that both of those elements are in this passage. That the vulnerable among us are to be protected and that the virtuous among us are to be recognized. Protect the vulnerable, recognize the virtuous. I think those elements are in, in this passage where we're getting this teaching about how to honor uh, widows. Verse 4, if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. Verse 5, she who is truly a widow left all alone has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. There's a, a virtue contrast, right? Uh, command these things as well so that they may be without reproach. Now, I'm, what I'm suggesting is that there are two categories of widows being presented in this passage. One category, those whom the church should give financial support to. This is one narrow element of what it means to honor a person but to give financial support to. And those are to be godly members of the people who are really a part of the church and who are left in a position with no other means of support. So that's one category of widow in this passage. The other is those to whom the church should not give financial support. And they are described as those who have other means of support and or are not really a part of the church, kind of living dissolute lives disconnected from uh, from godliness. Now, it's really important to see here that, that this is teaching. We're doing practical theology aimed at a very specific issue. And I can only imagine how a teaching like this might feel as you think about the reality of, of, the, of the pain of, the, of loss in the death of the husband that every widow feels. Qu quite apart from the financial means or the circumstances, that is a, a, a common uh, and important issue that is addressed in places in Scripture, but here is not the focal point. The focal point is on a specific issue in this first century Ephesian church about how to deal with this list of widows that are being supported financially by the church and how to think about that. So the question here is what is an appropriate way to honor, what is an appropriate way to help uh, those in need in the church. That brings us to the next point. Practice true godliness. Practice true godliness. We described earlier Jesus' heart, compassion, uh, readiness to honor people uh, who, who, who oftentimes felt you know, left all alone and, and unsupported. That heart, because God is the same yesterday and today and forever, is emblazoned upon the whole of the Old Testament as well. For example, Deuteronomy 10, 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods, Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice, here it is, for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner. It's a, uh, we would say a, a, a foreigner. Think of a person who's Oh, oh, has no support system, no social network, is just alone in, in this society, and they're trying to make it alone, that sort of thing. The sojourner. Uh, God gives him food and clothing, and now he commands his people, love the sojourner, therefore, and it implied the, the orphan and the widow as well. Love those in this circumstance, therefore, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Similarly, in, in chapter 24 of Deuteronomy, when you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over them again. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not strip it afterward. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. It seems to be, oh, he says, uh, God says, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this. 
You know what it was like to have no meat, to be destitute, to be helpless, and to be trapped in that. You know what that's like. And therefore, I command you to remember that and to treat people differently than you were treated. This is God talking to the ancient Israelites as a, as a society, as God's people. It's to be different than it was in Egypt among you. And it's interesting the way that the, 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 that the charity is described here um, because there's, there's a, 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 you get the sort of stages where it's time to harvest everything, but not every uh, fruit is, is quite at the point of ripeness where it's going to come off the, the tree or whatever. And so don't go back a second time and, 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 and just strip this thing down to the hole and you take it all. Leave something for somebody else is the idea. And also interesting in this is that the, the, the people of Israel, are, they're not told to collect all this and then they go give a certain amount. I mean, you can do that. But interestingly, in this passage, there's actually a provision for those who are to receive this benefit to actually work for it, to go behind in the fields and do some harvesting. And that, that's, I think that's an important idea here as well. But the, the, the general sense of this is God's people should have the heart that God has. We should love the outsider, protect the vulnerable, provide for those in need. Love like God loves. We see in, in, in James 1, 127, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. The reality of our faith shows in the way that we Live and what we do, connecting what we believe about God to what we do in the way that we live. James go on, goes on in chapter 2. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And that's the idea that comes out in this passage in a number of places like verse 4. If a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness. Practice, <laughs> practice the faith that they have to their own household and to make some return to their parents for this is pleasing in the sight of God. Let me, let me say something about the, the make some return thing. Because some of you may have this question, and it would be a good question. Uh, if, if you don't have it personally, you probably have friends or family um, that, that would identify with this. But every passage of Scripture, while it may touch certain topics, can't cover, we, we don't have an exhaustive coverage of every particular scenario. So some of you might be thinking, well, what about those of us that didn't have parents that raised us and took care of us the way that they should have. Many of us know, either personally or, uh, or, or because of the close friendships or relationships that we have, that some people, they've been abandoned. They've, they've not grown up with parents. Some, some people have been abused by their parents. I just want to acknowledge that this, what's happening in this passage is, is to assume the way that it should be, and that is where parents take care of their kids. Not perfectly, but where they raise their kids and care for their kids and provide for their kids. And what the Apostle Paul is saying is that when those grown kids and grandkids want to live a life of godliness, they need to, that, that needs to show up in the way that they honor their father and their mother, their grandfather and their grandmother, and so on. That's what's being said here. And so if your situation growing up looked profoundly different than, than what's assumed in this text, what it looks like for you to honor those in need in particular with, with your parents may look a little different. It might look different than, than what's being described here. And that's, that's okay. But we get the principle here. The apostle Paul sees fulfilling this commandment to honor father and mother as something that's essential to genuine godliness. And by the way, some people will never know how much you have done to take care of people in need in your family, your parents, or others around you, maybe close friends. Some people will never know that, but I want you to mark this passage well because God says that he sees it. He sees it. He knows exactly who you are and exactly what you are doing 
to love people the way that he loves them. And so mark this well and remember that God says, I am pleased by this. This is pleasing in the sight of God. Now the point of verse 8 was that we, you, you can't have a heart for God and, let leave, and yet at the same time leave your own parents destitute. If anyone doesn't provide for his relatives, especially members for, of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. What we believe shows up in the way that we live, in other words. So what we're seeing is that God's plan for protecting and providing for the vulnerable begins in one's own household. And by the way, the household concept in the first century was different than ours. It would have included immediate family and even extended family and in some cases non-blood related people. But that, it's the idea that, that, that those who are most closely related to us, we, we can't turn a blind eye to genuine uh, need. And lastly... I need to say uh, this because it's, it, it's important to what this, this scripture is teaching. That the church, us gathered together, we must not become the place where people offload their own responsibility to do what is good. To do what is right. To do what is necessary. It is easy. It is so easy to sort of paint with a broad brush this glob of people that we don't know by faces and say, well, it's, they'll take care of them. <laughs> and this scripture is saying... Let the children and the grandchildren first show their own godliness. And we can apply that principle broadly, but for the sake of time, I'm going to just, I'm going to keep moving because I think, I think we've, we've got it. It leads us to the last point in the text. Avoid misdirected compassion. Avoid misdirected compassion. Let's look back at this, verse 9. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work, but refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and so incur condemnation for having abandoned the former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows." There's a lot to unpack here, but so that we don't miss the forest for the trees, the bottom line, the bottom line of this paragraph is that there are times when helping hurts. Sometimes helping hurts. Let me talk about a few things. First of all, scholars have a little bit of trouble because they're not sure exactly what scenario is being in, uh, is underlying some of this teaching, but let me say a few things that I think are generally uh, pretty clear. Um, let a widow be enrolled. It, it's, it seems pretty clear that in this congregation, much like in Acts chapter 6 in the early Jerusalem church, there was a group of widows who had no other means of, of support that the church was providing for so that they could live. There was a daily distribution of, of grain in that first century uh, church in Jerusalem, and and. Something like that is happening here. There's a provision uh, for, for basic needs uh, that's happening, and the church has taken that on. Now, the Apostle Paul says, let her be enrolled if, and then gives a set of criteria. One of them has to do with age, and the other has to do with character, or I would put it this way. I think this is the best way to look at it. Enroll them if they are truly in need and truly a part of the church. I think those are the two big ideas that are being expressed here. We'll talk about true need in a minute. Let's talk about truly a part of the church because it's a little confusing, uh, some, some of what's being said here. First, the stuff about if she's been faithful to her husband, has raised her kids, the idea is, has, has been a faithful, uh, has lived a life of, of faithful Christian uh, participation in the church, has washed the feet of the saints, meaning has, has, has been a servant in the church. This is a person that we all know is a part of the church. This, this, this is what Paul's describing, Okay. 
What he contrasts that with is a little more obscure. It's a little harder to get a picture of this. But what we seem to have is, is some folks that are sort of uh, not so much a part of the church or it's not really clear what their connection is. And that's the part I think he's saying about um, the turning away from Christ and renouncing the former faith. What seems to be in view is that some people's commitment to Christ seems to, to wane as, as, as soon as they, they hit this trial. They've lost their husband, and now they're, they're returning to paganism uh, so that they can get a new relationship with a, with a man that's not a Christian. That, that seems to be the view, and, and the, the, the scenario that's in view. And so that's why I'm, I'm suggesting, I think the, the overall picture is, Paul is saying, be sure that the help helps. And be sure it helps the people who are most in need and the people who are really a part of this, this church family. I think that's the basic gist here. In other words, prioritize that. Now, um, okay, but what about the younger widows? Why, why, you know, what if a younger widow's really a part of the church, you know, has, has been serving faithfully even though she's much younger? Why, why not there? I think that the, the basic distinction here is along the lines of helplessness, of helplessness. That younger widows had options and abil- uh, abilities to provide for themselves that older widows in, in this scenario, in this context, did not have. I think that's the, the basic division here. And sometimes helping hurts. And that's where Paul's describing what happens when perhaps when we train dependence or, or when we incentivize idleness, when it's not, not necessary, that actually the help might be hurting some people. In fact, uh, our ability to work and to contribute to the world around us is actually a part of God's design for us, that, that in order to flourish, it's not good for us to sit around uh, uh, just dependent and so on unless we absolutely, are, it's, it's a reality uh, for us. It's actually good for us to provide and to work and to, and to do things to contribute and to support ourselves. So here are the broad principles that I think that, are, that we could just, three of them that we could just take out of this. One, a person should exhaust every virtuous option to provide for himself or herself before relying on others for that basic provision. A person should exhaust every virtuous option option to provide for themselves before relying on others for that provision. Secondly, it is good to recognize and to meet real need, especially in those who lived that way when they were able. In other words, it's not good to let people fall through the cracks who are genuinely in need among us. Third, it is not good No matter how tragic one's circumstances, it is not good to be treated as helpless when one is not. It's not good for a person to be treated as helpless when they are not. In other words, sometimes helping helps and sometimes helping hurts. So we must be compassionate people, but we must avoid misdirected compassion. I want to quickly share one prominent example in our society, that I think that we do a lot of these. But I read an article last week about, about a man um, who, who identifies as a disabled woman. What that means is his body works, but he, he, he feels like he should, be, um, he should be paralyzed from the waist down. And he uses a wheelchair. He uses a wheelchair, even though his legs work. And then the, the gender dysphoric part of that is, is, is part of it as well. And the reason I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning this is because I, I, I think that Christians, we, we, can, we can really get lost on, on two ends of the spectrum uh, that we see around us. So one end of the spectrum is it's, it's like a compassion at any price with no truth quotient in it, if that makes sense. And I, and I want to affirm the compassion part of that. For you, if your impulse inside your heart is to say, here's a person that's hurting, obviously hurting, and I want to be there and I want to meet that hurt with real compassion, yes, absolutely. But I don't want to meet that with reviling or mocking or reproach or whatever. I don't want to do that, right? That's... 
on, on the other hand, there is, a, there is a, a, a meeting of that real need with what is fundamentally not helpful. And I'm going to suggest to you, I mean, I've read a, uh, some books and, and I think the literature on this is just going to explode in the next decade because it's, it's, it's happening so fast and I think without enough of a, of a truth quotient. Um, misdirected compassion in some cases looks like taking a person who has a, 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 genuine, a, a genuine need, psychological need or malady. Gender dysphoria, for example, is real, right? Taking that and then meeting that with chemicals or surgeries, I think we will see in years to come, was misdirected compassion. And, and people are writing about it now. They're writing about their own experiences and saying, man, I was hurting so bad and I thought this would be the thing to do and I thought it would be good and people supported me. And now on the other side of that, that was a giant mistake and it was, guess what, irreversible. And we need, we need, we need both of those things. We need compassion we need a truth quotient in that compassion, right? So, so that's what the Apostle Paul's saying, something like that here. That let's be people with true faith who meet true need, right? With, with, with real compassion, true compassion. So in conclusion, where does this leave us? What, 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 what do we do with this as 21st century Christian individuals? Here, here's, here's the bottom line of it. Let's be people that meet real need with real help, with a real heart of compassion. That's, that's the idea here. Real need with real help from a real heart of compassion. We will transform people's lives when we honor them with genuine uh, compassion for them. I want to say I'm grateful for you, church. So many of you, you give of your time. You give money. You, you give in various other ways to meet physical, spiritual, and relational needs in this church community and in the, uh, the broader community around us. God sees it, and it makes a difference. Thank you. And let's continue to practice our, our godliness, our faith, by meeting real need with real help from a real heart of compassion. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this morning, um, the opportunity to gather with the church of Jesus Christ we pray that uh, as we ponder these things in the next few moments and consider how you would have us to respond to your word, that you would stir our hearts with faith, with repentance, where repentance is needed, with, with resolve where resolve is needed, uh, with, with understanding where that's needed. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.